Hello everyone. My name is Lauren McIntyre and I'm the technical manager for this session on food safety, chaired by Sonal Mugakachi. Thank you for taking part in the ANH Academy Week and we look forward to a robust and interactive session today. A quick reminder that everything you might need to access the conference materials and programme can be found on the ANH Academy website at anh-academy.org forward slash ANH2020. I've just launched a poll as you can see, um, so thank you for filling that out. Um, and we can see you know, who's, who's watched the, the videos of the pre-recorded presentations um, in order to make the most of today's discussion. So before Salome takes the conversation forward, I have a few technical announcements to ensure our experience is as smooth and interactive as possible. First, this session will be recorded and posted on the ANH Academy website following the conference. All participants have been muted, but please introduce yourselves using the chat function. Let us know your name, where you're joining us from, and the organisation you work with. You can access the chat box by clicking the chat button at the bottom of your Zoom window. We encourage you to share your webcam video feed during this session, but if you prefer not to, please add a profile picture so we can see your smiling face. When your video is off, you can do this by right-clicking on your name in the Zoom window and clicking Add Profile Photo. Later in the session, we will open up the conversation with a Q&A session. If you have questions, we invite you to share them in the chat box throughout the session, and we will do our best to raise them during the Q&A session. If we have time, we may have participants raise their hands so we can call on you to speak your question aloud. Finally, if at any point you experience technical issues, please check your audio settings and your internet connection. You can always try to reconnect to the session using the same Zoom link. If you have a technical question, please just send me a private message using the chat box. Thank you so much and over to you, Salome. Thank you so much, Lauren. It's a pleasure to have this meeting today, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, session on food safety. Uh, we have some very interesting presentations set up for us, and I'd like to just urge you all to feel free to uh, place your questions on the chat, and let's um, move on as we um, present the, the session. So first, I'd start, um, I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Salome Bukachi. I'm an associate professor at the University of Nairobi in the Institute of Anthropology, Gender and African Studies. I'm a medical anthropologist by profession and also um, undertake research in infectious diseases and nutritional anthropology. So I'd like to invite, um, I'd just like to present our key speakers for this session. We have Sarah Kariuki, a PhD student from Wageningen University and Research. We have Christo Patil, a professor in the College of Nursing, University of Illinois and Chica in Chicago. We have Kelvin Shikuku, a scientist with wild fish in Malaysia. And last but not least, we have Vivian Hoffman from E3. So each of them will take us. I believe all of us have interacted with them. I will introduce Sarah, who will start us off. And Sarah Kariuki is going to take us through uh, a, a study, um, a presentation entitled, Can Information Drive Demand for Safer Food? Impact of Brand Specific Recommendations and test results on product choice. Sarah, you have the floor. You have three minutes to give us a, a preview of your work. Welcome. Thank you very much, Salome. And um, I would like to share my screen. I have one slide on the same. 
So can information drive demand for safer food? And we look at the role of brand specific recommendations and test results on product choice. In this study, we tested the role of independent information and we call it independent because it's not associated with any given firm, um, but it's mainly based on previous research. And we look at the role of this information in stimulating demand for aflatoxin safer maize flour in Kenya. In our research design, we randomly assigned our households to three treatment groups to vary the kind of information. Uh, for the first group, we provided inform uh, general information on basically health effects of consuming contaminated foods, and this forms our control group. Another group was given the general information uh, plus the name of two existing brands that were previously found to be more likely to meet the Kenyan limit. That's 10 parts per billion. And also the result that the price of the brand is negatively correlated with contamination or the more expensive brands are more likely to be safer. Another group was given the general information the brand recommendations and also a test result of the flour that was being consumed at the time of visit, showing whether the flour is above or below the Kenyan limit. So the households were visited again eight weeks after, and in our results, we show that compared to the general information group, the group that received the brand recommendations were not more likely to be consuming the recommended brands or even uh, consuming more expensive brands, indicating that there was no effect of information for that group. However, for the group that received the test results, we find that they were more likely to be consuming uh, one of the recommended brands and also to be consuming an expensive, uh, a more expensive brand at end line compared to the general information group. Therefore, our, uh, our study shows that information can result in changing behavior by consumers, but only when this information is accompanied by testing results, showing whether the household is exposed to risk or not. But still we note that even for the group that received the test result, and especially those who are told that their flower was contaminated, a majority did not change around 70%. And this implies that consumer demand alone will not be sufficient in this setting to drive food safety. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that interesting um, presentation. I will now open up, um, I will present, invite the next speaker and that is Crystal Patil, to also take us through aspects of food safety in Tanzania. Uh, keep posting your questions on the Q&A on the chat, and after the sessions, we'll have a time when we will um, address the issues. So, Crystal, you have the floor. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for, for that. I appreciate it. Um, my name is Crystal Patil, and I'm from the University of Illinois at Chicago. And today I am representing a much larger team, of course, and they are all pictured here. And we are part of a study that's referred to as the DECIDE study, where we're looking at geospatial mapping um, and the food environment to characterize the food environment for those um, who are affected by HIV and living in peri-urban Dar es Salaam. And we focus on food, food safety because foodborne illness is something that is a growing public health concern. Uh, and you can see the statistics here um, showing why Sub-Saharan Africa um, is of focus and the importance of considering food safety with, for those with HIV given their susceptibility to infection. So what we've been able to do from 40 interviews is sort of collate some food safety information from, um, from what people were talking to us about. And we found that their uh, exposure to the media, their individual experiences and their observations uh, played a role in making decisions about their food choices. 
So the food, uh, the media aspect of this is that um, we saw positives and negatives. And an example that was a negative um, or positive, I guess, if you learned about it, but turned out to be um, a rumor about the plastics in rice. Um, this was something that had been hit the media. Um, and then um, two years later, although not substantiated, is still something that some of our participants were concerned about. Others talked about learning positive things like the washing of hands and its importance for, for removing bacteria. Uh, another important aspect in decision making about foods was about their familiarity um, with the vendor. Uh, and so we, we had one, one person who said, I buy vegetables from only two women. Um, I don't buy from any vendor. And this was also um, familiarity and experience with a particular vendor was important, but also um, observing how the foods were grown and other visual cues about cleanliness were important factors. And impressions of good hygiene came up um, where people talked about what they could see from the window and um, assumptions about good hygiene and cleanliness. And we also saw that vendors picked up on how important this was and the packaging of the food and the wearing of white aprons were interpreted as, um, as good hygiene. However, no one mentioned the um, raw chicken and uh, cooked chicken being right next to each other. So here, um, the chemical and growing conditions, as I mentioned, were problematic. Um, modern chickens or um, improved chickens were a concern because of the pesticide or the antibiotics and the growing conditions. Similarly, leafy greens, there was a worry because these were being, were seen grown in sewage um, or near sewage uh, and the same for tubers. So what people did to avoid exposures is um, the strategies they employed were just simply not eating outside of the home. And if they did, they could wash chemicals and residues off of raw foods. And as I mentioned, their strategies for purchasing was about being loyal to a vendor that they had good experiences with and those they could observe the hygiene um, practices um, themselves. So what we learned is that in the context of Tanzania, where there's little regulation and few objective indicators, our participants put together pieces of information to affect their food purchasing and eating decisions. And the three main areas were the agricultural chemical aspects, the production conditions, and contamination from um, human contamination. Thanks for listening. And um, let me just acknowledge our team here. Thank you, Crystal, for uh, taking us through um, the food safety issues in Tanzania. Uh, quite some informative aspects there. And I'll keep reminding us to keep posting any questions or any comments on the chat as we move along. Uh, we have listened uh, to presentation from Kenya. We went to Tanzania. And now we are changing uh, shift and moving to West Africa uh, and Nigeria where we'll have Kevin Kelvin Chikuku, a scientist with World Fish in Malaysia, to take us through consumer demand for seafood safety and environmental sustainability certification, experimental evidence from Nigeria. Welcome, Kelvin. Thank you. Th uh, thanks, uh, Salome. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for joining. I'm very excited to, uh, to have the opportunity to speak about an experiment that uh, we conducted in Nigeria to, to basically understand uh, consumers' demand for you know, fish food safety and uh, as well as environmental sustainability certification. Uh, my name is Kelvin Shikuku. I'm with World Fish, uh, based uh, in Malaysia. Uh, and this experiment is part of, uh, of an ongoing uh, activity, uh, which was uh, a little bit motivated by the fact that one way to, uh, to improve food safety is by uh, sort of providing incentives to producers so that they can uh, adopt improved, uh, you know, uh, improved um, uh, practices and uh, technologies to help, um, you know, in uh, in production of uh, of safe and quality fish. So 
So basically we wanted to, uh, the, the whole experiment looks at whether premiums can then be transferred from the consumers back to the producers to provide uh, uh, those incentives for, for adoption of the practices. Um, so what we did to, for us to understand whether there's really a premium in the market for fish food safety you know, certification is we conduct an experiment with 200 uh, uh, fish consumers in Lagos uh, state. Uh, so basically presenting different, um, uh, different products varying uh, different attributes, including live fish and, uh, and, um, and smoked fish, and also varying different sizes, um, so large fish and small fish, um, and of course varying the status, whether it's certified or not certified. And so in, uh, in that experiment, uh, the key findings coming from that experiment is that we see that consumers uh, th there's positive and significant premiums in the market for safety certified fish. Uh, but there seems to be some asymmetry in the value of the certification scheme so that consumers seem to be sort of um, only willing to pay for larger fish. So what in our case we are calling um, uh, high value products, so either the large sized uh, catfish or uh, the smoked products, but we don't we don't find any positive and significant premiums for smaller uh, live. Um, so, uh, th I mean that tells us a little bit uh, uh, how how we design certification schemes. I ask sort of points us to think about producers in different types of products to the market. Sorry, Kelvin. Those and we are losing you a bit, Kelvin. Ah, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Just repeat sorry, the last yeah. sentence. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, sorry. Sorry for that. I was saying uh, those findings point us to think a little bit how certification schemes are designed because producers are supplying different types of products and consumers are going to value that differently, right? So that in terms of, for example, the complexity of the schemes, these findings seems to point us to the fact that we may rethink um, the, the complexity and the cost of compliance of certification schemes to vary depending on the different products that producers are supplying so that we don't assume that the compliance costs uh, uh, and the complexity of the scheme will work for everyone, right? So pushing, for example, the, the producers who are producing small life uh, certified products, when that product doesn't fetch um, a premium in the market, they may incur costs, but you know, they may not actually be able to, uh, to recover the cost of, uh, of compliance. But, but, that, but in, ter in, terms of the, in terms of the large fish and the smoked fish, yes, there is a premium. Uh, so the, in terms of cost of compliance, uh, there is, you know, uh, um, stringency can, yes, be forced uh, at that level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelvin, uh, for taking us to West Africa in Nigeria and uh, telling us about an experimental game that looked at um, the willingness to pay for safety uh, certified fish. Um, on the same vein, we are going to uh, cross over back to Kenya and uh, we are going to invite Vivian Hoffman, who will take us through. Uh, Vivian Hoffman is from IFPRI and she will take us through demand for aflatoxin safe maize in Kenya, dynamic response to price and advertising. Um, Vivian Hoffman, you're welcome. The stage is yours. Now I'm unmuted. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Salome. Um, I'm presenting joint work with Christine Moser at Western Michigan University and Tim Herman at Texas A&M on the dy consumer's dynamic response to food safety promotion um, in Kenya. So as we see food systems become modernized and more complex and more food um, going through the hands of large processors, um, there is increasing scope for firms to market their products based on food safety because testing at these scales is feasible and branding at these scales is, is very effective. Um, this also implies, implies easier um, ability for regulators to, to enforce food safety standards. 
But in this paper, what we want to do is try to understand to what extent can firms harness potential consumer demand for food safety. Um, and that's still a big open question. There's quite a bit of research looking at consumer demand for food safety, but most of it relies either on hypothetical stated willingness to pay or elicits willingness to pay immediately after talking to consumers about food safety. So what we try to do in this paper is look at it in a longer term setting. And we do this in eastern Kenya, which is a hotspot for aflatoxin, a common contaminant of maize that comes from fungal um, contamination. And it is a place where uh, people are very concerned about this particular food safety hazard. So we thought it would be a e relatively easy place to get people to, to actually seek out food, safer food. We worked with Osho Grain Millers, which is a medium-sized maize milling firm uh, based in Nairobi, um, to build their capacity for aflatoxin testing. Um, and Tim Herman from Texas A&M led that effort. Uh, he founded an organization called Aflatoxin Proficiency Testing and Control in Africa. Um, and so, or Aptica. So Aptica brought the, the firm up to speed on their aflatoxin testing and got them compliant with the Kenyan regulatory standard. We then tracked maize, maize flour sales in 73 small shops in eastern Kenya where we randomized the promotion of the flour based on this testing. Our study design um, was such that some shops only got marketing, so someone would stand outside their shop and distribute flower, uh, flyers, and also we put up a, a poster advertising the branding of the flower as food safe. Um, these promotions lasted for one week, and in another group of shops, the promotion was combined with a temporary discount, and in a further subset, these, either the discount or the marketing alone was repeated three times. The timing was also randomized, so we can control for time effects. Tupique, the target brand, was a bit less expensive than other brands that were sold in these shops. So this is really a mass market brand um, and accounted for about a sixth of total maize flower sales. Um, these maize flowers, the packaged maize flowers, though, are more expensive than informally marketed whole grains, which people can then mill. Our results show, uh, first to focus on the blue diamonds. Um, the blue diamonds represent marketing only. So as you can see, in our first week of active promotion, we see an increase in this, the weekly sales of the target brand compared to other weeks. Um, and this holds for another week, but then it becomes insignificant. We see it go up again when we're actively promoting it again, and then it falls. By week three, during our active promotion of marketing only, we don't see a significant effect. And by the end of our study period, we're right back down to where the control is. In the, when we also offered the discount for more intensive promotion, we see, of course, a huge effect when the discount is active, right? This is a 10% discount on the maze. But what's really interesting is that people seem to um, continue their purchase behavior of that heavily marketed food um, for subsequent weeks. Um, again, we did this, this count in a subset of shops, and again, we see a lagged effect. In the third week of promotion, we were not allowed to offer a discount because the uh, competitor shops were getting upset that they weren't getting a discount. Um, and so here we did marketing only. And we see some lagged effect, but again, by the end of the study period, we're seeing this return to the same level as controls. So... To conclude, what we have seen in the study is that the effect of food safety marketing is initially quite strong, but it, especially when it's intensive, but it fades over time. And this really highlights that much of the existing literature likely overstates consumer willingness to pay for safe food in the long run. If you don't continuously press consumers with this message, and even if you do over time, it's just not the most important thing on their minds. Um, we also saw in the study some drawbacks of food safety-based marketing from the firm's perspective. First of all, it was difficult to maintain compliance continuously. So the firm's customers, the wholesalers, complained when they couldn't get the labeled maize anymore, when they had to take the label off because they weren't compliant that week. Um, this labeling also drew increased regulatory scrutiny from the government, and we were able to show records of this new testing program, and, and it, it worked out for the firm, but it was something that made them quite nervous. And in the end, they discontinued their labeling after the end of the study period. 
So finally, what we take away from this study is that the, a purely market-based approach to food safety is unlikely to be very effective in mass markets um, because it just fades over time and it's not likely to be profitable. But if there, I think there is some scope for social marketing from an independent third party to be trusted more, perhaps have a longer term effect as we've seen in Sarah's study. Um, and regulatory enforcement, of course, is, is critical as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vivian. And at this juncture, I'd like to, if we were able to clap for all of you, the presenters, thank you all for um, an interesting perspective on the work that you do and the aspects of food safety. So within this session, we've been looking at food safety issues, uh, focusing on research in Sub-Saharan Africa. And one of the things we realize is that food safety is quite a key issue right now globally especially with the increase in foodborne diseases. And therefore, there is need for us to be, uh, as researchers and as scientists, to look into the issues of food safety to try and deal with the aspects and see how we can manage uh, the situation. Across all the different areas that have been presented, we have talked about consumer aspects. We have talked about information, provision of information to communities, we have talked about marketing aspects, and all those are the aspects that um, the presentations uh, have been looking at in this session. So right now, I'd like to um, open up uh, the discussions, and uh, I would like to start by asking the presenters. There's a question that has been raised. How can short-term changes in consumer behavior with regards to food safety labeling be transformed into longer term behavior change and food safety awareness. And I'm opening it up to the panelists, uh, especially um, Vivian, you've talked on consumer, consumer aspects. We can start with you. And then Kelvin can also come in and uh, let us know uh, his take. Okay, so sorry, the question was specifically- How can short how can short-term changes in yep. consumer behavior mm -hmm. with regards to food safety labeling be transformed into longer-term behavior change and food safety awareness? Okay, so I think it, our study shows the short-term changes we see do not necessarily last. And that's, that's really important. Consumers need to be continuously reminded um, and perhaps have other elements of the choice architecture modified so that either unsafe food isn't available or they're getting independent information that they can trust about which food is safe. Um, now, well, we, we did see lasting effects on knowledge in our study. So people were much more aware of the specific health consequences of aflatoxin. So I think these private marketing campaigns can have some lasting impacts, but consumer behavior is, is quite difficult to change. And we see the same in the marketing literature generally, that marketing campaigns, whatever they're based on, um, will have some effect, but that will decay over time. Thanks for that. Kelvin, would you like to chip in? Yes, maybe just briefly to add on, uh, on what Vivian said. Um, I, mean, I mean, especially looking at the context in which we conducted our experiment is first of all, uh, so when we held, for example, uh, a multi-stakeholder workshop just to understand how things were, we, we realized that first of all, knowledge on food safety issues, fish food safety particularly was very low. And so, I mean, so if you're starting from such like reference points uh, and then given the, the, the you know, what, what Vivian just mentioned that we see knowledge sort of going up and then, uh, you know, uh, quickly again, sort of um, diminishing. So, uh, so, I mean, just to emphasize again the need for like continued um, uh, knowledge diffusion and continued uh, education around these issues. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to, to speak about is that this mm -hmm. experiment was part of uh, several others. And uh, in, in another experiment, we look at, for example, expectations and how expectation, uh, consumers' expectations about, um, um, you know, food safety issues, how that can influence uh, demand. And so what we see is that, let's say, if there's, a, if there's uncertainty in the market about the availability of the product for consumers' purchase, then some of these um, uh, interventions in terms of knowledge creation may not actually, um, uh, in my view, may not um, uh, induce uh, sustainable behavior, right? So let's say, 
if um, if uh, if the cost of um, of the if the cost of compliance at the producer level is so high, so that producer cannot guarantee that there's going to be a sustained supply of the product, so that on the consumer side, yes, they be willing to purchase the product, but I go to the market first time, second time, three, third time, there's no product. A certified product, we may easily see that people may hard on, you know, the inferior product, even though they they sort of have the knowledge. So I think it's a combination of uh, of different things. But um, in the context of developing countries, there's also really dealing with the issue of uncertainty around availability of certified products in the in the market. Yeah, certification is a, a key thing when we are talking about food safety and uh, consumer behavior is quite critical in terms of uh, uh, policies that relate to certification and uh, uh, food, uh, purchasing of certified foods. I'd like to uh, bring in Crystal. Given that you're looking at um, human behavior and you're looking at community perceptions, how does that link to aspects of consumer behavior when we're talking about uh, food safety issues? It's interesting that you came to me because I was just thinking as I was listening to this that not one of our participants even mentioned certification or concerns in that from that perspective. And so um, I, I'm curious about that. Now, our questions were very simple. We were just asking, what are you concerned about? What worries you around food safety? So we weren't specifically interrogating anything around marketing, but no one mentioned that at all. Uh, most of their concerns were very localized and not really about the larger level national policies. That's quite interesting. And I think it's something key that we need to be thinking about as researchers as we move along in terms of aspects of food safety. Um, there's a, a question here. How do panelists think? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting it to all the panelists. How do you think about the current COVID-19 pandemic? That how might it influence consumer perceptions of food safety in their research contexts? Might this also impact food choices? Sarah, would you like to take on that question? Okay, thank you. Um, that's a tough one. But I think... Um, it helps to direct the consumer's attention to some of the things that, um, that are important also for food safety, like hand washing and all those practices. And I think we are going to find some positive effects from this. Uh, and also because consumers sometimes, if they are worried about something and people have been worried, and also in our study we show that it, like testing generally or telling someone something is contaminated, you find results, uh, effects there. So like if consumers are worried, then we are likely to find some significant change in behavior, not necessarily in terms of product choice, but in food handling in general. And I think there's going to be some positive effects of this in terms of improved food safety outcomes. Thank you, Sarah. To chip in. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Sarah. I'd like to again pick it back with Crystal. Given that your work was looking at um, adult perspectives on food safety and handling of food uh, with people living with HIV, uh, what do you think about this COVID-19 pandemic and how it might influence the consumer perceptions of food safety, um, especially I based on your experience? Yeah, thank you. Um, Obviously, we, this all took place prior to what was going on currently, so um, all of this is a best guess. Um, but I agree with Sarah that perhaps from an individual level, people's um, own um, choices will be changed in terms of how they behave with hand washing and, um, and how they shop. Um, but from another study, so this isn't from our current work, but from another study, and my colleague may be on right now, um, they are finding that there's impacts on the movement for, as people are um, limited in their movements, it's, uh, it's affecting the market. And so um, people can't get what they need and they also can't get out to the market what they normally distribute. So we have 
very large economic impacts about the movements of food. But on an individual level, I think it's um, like what Sarah said, people are going to be in tune with hygiene more. Thanks, Crystal. Um, Kelvin, uh, there's a question for you. What do you think is the mechanism behind the differences in consumers' willingness to pay based on the size of the fish? Um, yeah, that, <laughs> that's an interesting one. I think, uh, well, so the, in the experiment itself, we don't test sort of what, what the mechanisms that sort of try, that predict this, um, uh, you know, this pattern that we observe. But uh, I mean, for us, what uh, what comes out, um, what we can see from the from the data very clearly, is that um, it, it it seems that consumers just have preferences for uh, for you know what we are calling high value quote in quotes high value fish product. Uh, like I said, so either the the live certified larger fish or the smoked products, but not for the smaller ones. And um, I mean. It's a little bit difficult to tell why they are why they would they would uh, decide to value products that way because we are speaking about uh, like 500 gram of live uh, uh, live catfish. Um, so it, I don't know whether whether basically that may mean that there's sort of uh, in the context where we conduct the experiment is like at the points of purchase and we we we, we it's not targeted to like only the high end market so we would. We, we rule out, I think, at least um, to a certain extent, that only the only like the wealthy consumers were were, were willing to pay, right, for these types of products. Uh, so, I mean, the mechanism for us is a little bit uh, difficult to explain at this point because we don't explore. But I think what we see clearly from the data is that pattern where there seems to be preference for the uh, for the larger and uh, the larger certified and the smoked fish. Um, uh, so uh, thinking a little bit about what, what, whether people, because th those fish already fetch, they sort of already have uh, a higher a higher prices, right? So you could you could imagine that people that are buying those products are already paying a little bit uh, a little bit more compared to the smaller fishes. Um, yeah, but it's 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 not clear to me yet what may be driving that particular. Um, uh, that particular pattern. Although, like I said, this is part of an, an ongoing um, uh, research. It's just a component of a bigger of, of a bigger study, and so there's room for us to explore that uh, uh, that question. Yeah. Uh, do you think that your findings would be different for other animal source foods? Uh, uh, yeah. No. I mean, I think that it would be interesting. So first, let's say generally when, when in most of the studies that we've seen, uh, in most cases, we don't see that these types of, uh, I mean, we don't see experiments where products are varied, for example, by sizes, right? In most cases, products will, will just be varied by, you know, uh, uh, the certification uh, status. Uh, and so mo most studies have not been able to really uh, show uh, these types of asymmetries, right? So that we're, 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 every time we pick a positive premium, so think of it, if we didn't have this uh, the disaggregation by sizes of products, we would have clearly shown that there was, there's a positive premium in the market, right? So I, I, I guess it's the same with, the, with, with meats, with, I mean, with other animal source um, uh, products, but we would have to, I think it would, it would require an empirical study to, to assess that, because I mean, this is just one, one, one experiment that uh, that um, uh, makes efforts to show such asymmetries, but I can imagine that uh, it's um, yeah it, it might be possible that we observe this type of uh, uh, of things. Although you have to also take into account that there are differences there, right? I mean, these small fishes are sold live. The meat is sort of you know you um, uh, so like uh, you know you know you 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 get a piece you know you pay for a piece that satisfies a certain certain weight or something like that. So I mean, whether those elements um, uh, count when we think about fish versus uh, other animal uh, animal source. Uh, I mean, uh, other animal uh, 
uh, proteins, I think uh, that's a question that can only be answered with, uh, with the real data. Thank you, Kelvin. And Sarah is interested to know uh, what is the share of small fish consumers in the market? Could that have some implication in terms of um, your, what you found in the field? Uh, in, in the markets, um, in, in the markets, all these all these products are there. So basically, what uh, what uh, fish sellers in in uh, in, uh, in Nigeria do is, you know, they will have sort of buckets, uh, and we focus on catfish. So we are speaking about like live um, uh, live catfish, right? So of of different sizes. So typically, a consumer would arrive there, identify the size that they they want, and uh, you know, and then negotiate on that and pay for it. So I think, in my estimation, I think that all the types, all the different sizes that we consider in this experiment were, were available in the market, okay? Uh, and uh, and there, there, there didn't seem to be like, uh, let's say one size being dominant over another. There seemed to be sort of in equal proportion in, in the market. So um, I wouldn't say that the share is sort of um, a larger for a certain size than, than the other. Thank you, Kelvin. Um, in relation to aflatoxin, Sarah, there's a question from Lisa and Hassan requesting that you uh, elaborate on the method of testing used for aflatoxins. And also, um, is it possible to continue testing for aflatoxins at the household level? And can this be done at scale? Okay, thank you. So we conducted uh, rapid tests. Um, neogen tests. Uh, so they're basically uh, fast, uh, around 10 to 15 minutes, and they just show whether the product is, the, the level of aflatoxin is below or above a certain, like in the Kenyan case, 10 parts per billion. So it's also easy to conduct in the field because it's fast, but also it's also easy to share the results with the households. Um, in terms of testing at the household level, I think the tests are quite expensive. So uh, in terms of policy, that wouldn't be feasible. But um, these results uh, can be um, upscaled by the government. Like, for example, the government, uh, in the course of their um, testing, like the normal test in their in terms of their regulation and then sharing the results of their testing to people. But of course, that also, whether that will be effective also is an open question because again, now we've moved to individualized tests to just general information in terms of specific brands which have been found probably to be above the limit. So I think at the household level, it's not feasible but it can be done by the government. Thanks, Sarah. While you're still at it, uh, Hi Ngo would like to know, how are the health effects of aflatoxin communicated to participants? Um, sorry, I, I saw that question and I thought maybe I didn't come out clearly. Uh, so we just uh, told people about the effects of consuming contaminated foods, like it has uh, been known to cause liver cancer associated with stunting in children and also in some cases also associated with um, low immunity. So yeah, I hope I've answered the question. I thought I didn't come out clearly in my presentation, but that is the general information that we gave. Um, I think Hai Ngo will, we, we will place it on the chat again in case there's something that needs clarification. But maybe, Sarah, what uh, comes out is also there's the aspect of risk communication. Sometimes when we talk to um, communities about uh, particular issues, the way they understand it and perceive it is very different. And because of that, different perceptions of risk communication, sometimes communities don't pick up some of the interventions that are put in place. So maybe it's just related to that aspect of risk communication. Do the communities perceive of this as a health risk? And do they pick it up based on that perception? 
Um, I think in this case they do because actually the level of awareness and knowledge about aflatoxin is quite high in Kenya because of the the media attention and also the severe cases that has happened over the years. So I think it's 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 our, most consumers are well aware of the problem of aflatoxin. All right, so um, now we move to Crystal. Crystal, uh, Lydia would like to understand, is wondering if the absence of discourse on marketing in Tanzania could be related to the type of outlet from which foods are acquired as more localized options would have less branded or packaged options. Yeah, absolutely. And we were working in a peri-urban part of the city, so outside of the city. And um, But there are brands, like there's all kinds of stores and there's all kinds of brands. And um, you see advertisements all over those stores trying to, um, you know, influence people. But what um, when we did have people talking about a specific packaged food or a particular brand of something. Um, it usually was linked to a rumor that they've heard or something that they noticed or learned from social media or the media. So from the radio, from a newspaper or from um, WhatsApp, we're finding is a very popular source for food safety, um, spreading of information around food safety and concerns. Of course, that's a targeted and limited population that has access in that way, um, but um, there were a few times when people talked about a particular oil, there were rumors that this oil had some kind of like gasoline added to it. Um, so there was fear around that. Um, I already mentioned the plastic rice, the resin that's kind of added to rice to bulk it up. Um, and then another one that came up was a particular kind of juice. So bottled juices um, that no matter, th there's no way to know um, if they're safe or not safe and that people were concerned that things would grow in them. And so that like that the expiration date on them wasn't something that was really informative. Um, but again, not really related to that, that marketing idea, mostly about the social media aspects or where their information is coming from. I see Vivian has a question. Oh, just to add on to your, your response there. I mean, I think that we don't see a lot of certification in these markets at all. So it's not surprising to me that you wouldn't see it. And there's a, re there's a number of reasons for that, right? There's a lot of legal ambiguity about what claims companies are allowed to make on their products. And so they're afraid to do anything that might step out of line. Um, and it's also expensive to certify typically. So there are barriers and if they're uncertain about the consumer response, then you know, that's why we subsidize the certification for this company because we figured, you know, there's, there's entry barriers um, that might be prohibitive. And we thought, well, if we can show that it works, then maybe we'll catalyze something. Uh, it didn't seem to. <laughs> so maybe there's, you know, there's, there's very good reasons that firms don't go this route. And, and it definitely we... highlighted for us the importance of social media and media for, um, for how people learn. And so um, definitely an area to continue to investigate. So Crystal, have you picked up um, from the information you learned, have you done any intervention in the community? No, this is a very descriptive study at this time. So we're not doing interventions right now, but the, um, the idea is that we'll learn enough to move to that level. All right, so um, I move to Vivian and uh, you've talked about the consumers and uh, the aspects of uh, having the brands certified. And I think that's an, an important aspect that sometimes um, as consumers, I will talk from the consumer perspective. So consumers, uh, maybe because of lack of knowledge, uh, do not quite look at the brands or look at the certification in some of the packaging. I don't know what your perspective was and your experience with the consumers looking out for those brands certified aspects in uh, your study? Well, we asked consumers in a follow-up survey whether they could recognize the certification mark that means um, aflatoxin verified testing and 
the basically the treatment had no impact on on recognition of the the label. So I think you're right. The consumers have limited bandwidth to to deal with all these labels and things. You know, there's already a label um, from the government saying that the food has been approved for sale, and so it, it's quite reasonable that consumers should expect that to mean that the food is safe. Um, and adding extra layers of labeling um, may just confuse people with information overload. However, I think that it I think what Sarah's study really shows is that information is important. Um, and when you show people real differences across brands, which is what you end up doing with testing, right? You test it and you show them that they have a problem and then they act on that information. You can scale that up by telling people, look, the informally marketed flour is three times as likely to contain aflatoxin above the legal limit compared to the branded flour. And that would be something the government could do without compromising its, its sort of implication of safety for branded flour generally, right? So I think there's actually a really policy relevant outcome of the work that Sarah presented, that information is important and quantitative information is important and relative safety information is important. And it's tricky because governments don't want to say, well, this brand is safe, but this brand isn't safe. Because implicitly they've told us that all the brands in the market are safe because they've approved them for sale. But at least you could compare it to unbranded um, informally sold products and, and potentially have a big effect on consumers that way. So uh, Daniel Mbogo would like to know, following up on uh, just the discussion we are having, did you check how information from other non-independent sources of information influence demand of the FLA? That's... All right, Sarah, go ahead. Was that okay? Um, I, I don't understand the question, but we said independent in this case because it was based on previous research and unlike in the case of the other study with, uh, by Vivian, it was not associated with any specific brand. It was just presenting results from a previous study. So no, we just tested that information. So we didn't vary like different sources of information in our study. Um, and this is to you and Vivian. Um, you're talking about the flour that has been milled and is packeted and sold in the shops. We know that a lot, especially in the rural areas, there's a lot of um, milling of the grain in the posho mill. Um, how does this play out when you're talking about issues of food safety and the aflatoxin levels? Are those also places where you would be looking at? And did you look at that in your study? So our studies were both done in, in towns or urban areas. Um, and so we're looking at a population that does get most of their, their maize flour from commercial sources. But I think there is also, there's other research that, that I've done looking at the, the visible attributes that are correlated with food safety in, in those whole grains. And so there's things that consumers could be told to look out for. You can look out for cracked grain and avoid those grains. And nobody's done an intervention on that yet, but um, you know, there's potential for, for trying some things, even without traceability and packaging. Yeah, because... Um a lot among the populations, you'd find populations assuming that the milled flour, when uh, a farmer mills their flour, it's more healthier than the flour that is um, in the shop. Yet we know that depending on the maize they use, that may impact on the safety levels. Sarah, I think you did some qualitative work on that, didn't you? Yeah, so it's true, like um, the meal, generally the portion meal flour, whether from unproduced maize or from maize purchased from the market, is considered uh, to be more nutritious. And that's why it's preferred by most of the people. But for example, data from our test results uh, indicated that this is also like even on produced flowers more likely to be contaminated than the purchased brands. So I think, yeah. And there's a bit of a, there's a relationship there because of the, the wholeness of the grain. So the bran is in the, the wholemeal flour and that's where a lot of the, the contamination 
arises or is, right? And so when you strip the flower in the refining process of that brain, you strip your uh, brand, you strip it of some of its healthfulness and nutritional value, but you also get rid of that potential contamination. Yes. And so uh, I think it's also good to promote adoption of food safety technologies by small scale farmers to protect yes. their grain. That yeah. way they can consume their health, their whole grain flour. Yeah, and in fact, we see very little switching. In our study, we looked at where did consumers change when they, when they were purchasing more of this um, branded, labeled aflatoxin safe flour, who, were, what were they switching out of? And it was not whole grain. It was, it was unbranded milled flour, which is good because that stuff is pretty bad too um, in terms of aflatoxin safety. But uh, they, you can't really get people to switch from whole grain. It's just the price difference is too big. Thank you. And still to Sarah and Vivian, Peter Opio would, uh, has, has a question. In East Africa, there are food safety standards for green, but not for the horticultural sector. Does IFPRI have any ongoing work on this within the East African Central Bloc? So there are some, there are at least codes of practice for horticulture, right? And, and um, the export sector of horticulture in Kenya has been very good at meeting those standards. Um, and the domestic sector for produce has not been so successful. And so we have started some work looking at horticultural food safety. We have found quite a bit of heavy metal contamination, um, which has also come out in recent estimates of the global burden of disease, that heavy metal contamination is a serious source of, of ill health globally, um, especially in Africa. Um, we've also found that the sanitation and hygiene facilities are extremely lacking. So, and there has been work done by others in, in Kenya and elsewhere in East Africa showing high levels of microbial um, contamination of fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and so we're hoping to continue our work um, in, that, in that sector because grain uh, contamination and mycotoxin contamination actually accounts for a relatively low burden uh, proportion of the burden of known foodborne disease. Um. This is now to Kelvin. We are going to a question on methodology. Mohammed and Haingo would like to ask uh, if you could elaborate on how the experiment, could you share how you decided on the sample size and how the experiment was organized? Sorry, sorry, I was, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, thanks for those questions. So, um, this experiment, um, I mean, uh, maybe starting with the issue of sample size, I mean, so basically, um, uh, we did some, uh, some calculations, and, and I'm happy Vivian is also here, who is sort of, uh, you know, part of that team, so <laughs> she can help to discuss the protocol. But basically, our, 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 in our research protocol, we, you know, we, we for example, um, we base our sample size on, uh, on power calculation. And um, uh, and the issue of, uh, of of how exactly the experiment was conducted is that so we work with pairs of of um, we had ten enumerators and we had working in pairs of two basically, and so what we did was we were recruiting participants every second participant uh, every second consumer entering the market with the intention to buy fish was approached and was. Uh, uh, explain the study too, and uh, and then led to another stand in the market. So at the points where the fish is being sold, and uh, there was another enumerator there that then led the led the participant through the you know through the experiment. And so I mean, so this is not um, is not like what we would call like a lab experiment. It's it's an it's a, it's it's experiment that was performed with uh, consumers at points of purchase and with real fish. And in the bidding game, if they won, for example, they actually bought the fish and and um, and, uh, and went with it at home, right? So, um, so in that sense, then our experiment is, you know, in what uh, what we would call like an incentive compatible experiment. Um, uh, but but like I said, it's it's a, it's part of four other experiments that we conduct um, uh, and in different uh, parts of uh, of. Um, 
uh, different local government areas in uh, in Nigeria. So this was not sort of conducted in one market and in one local government area. We worked in um, uh, we worked in four local government areas, and we considered different types of markets, including uh, uh, the roadside market, including the main markets, and also including the supermarkets. Uh, I've also seen a question asking about, for example, whether we control for, for you know, issues such as culture and religion, which may, uh, you know, ethnicity or religion, which may also, uh, you know, have, have an effect on consumer demand. And so at the end of the experiment, we had um, a short post-experiment survey where we asked those types of questions that help us to control for some of these, uh, some of those uh, uh, additional factors that we know may influence demand. Okay. So combined with that, um, uh, you know, the experiment combined with this post-experiment survey, which also asked about knowledge of consumers about food safety, we are able to control for, for most of the other factors that influence consumer demand. Thank you, Kelvin. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about aspects of um, community perception about food safety. Does it align to uh, the standard or the conventional uh, food safety, uh, what food safety is? What do consumers say is food safety? Yes, so <laughs> that's an interesting question and I think an, a very important one. So in our experiment, just to paint a little bit again of background is that the government of Nigeria so first of all, this is designed within sort of an aquaculture perspective, right? So aquaculture has been growing tremendously, contributing substantially to, you know, improving people's livelihood. And so the government is asking how they can sort of, uh, yes, sustain that growth, but at the same time caring about um, uh, health hazards so that, you know, people are not exposed to health hazards. So how, how do you achieve that? So the government has sort of developed a set of guidelines uh, that are supposed to guide con uh, producers Producers are basically supposed to follow those guidelines in a voluntary way uh, in, in their production processes, right? And so the government monitors that. Uh, and so the, the fish basically that we use in our experiment were then sourced from those particular um, producers that have sort of already been certified by the government as having uh, met the, 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 the requirements, okay? And for, of course, for the non-certified products, we obtain them uh, in the market. So we present more. We present the product, including the process that was followed by the producers, uh, uh, to produce those products. And so we see that uh, our, our, the consumers in our experiments make the decision, having understood what processes were followed in producing the product. Okay. And so in that sense, then I, I, I you know, I, I have confidence that consum consumers were really uh, bidding. On, uh, on, on food safety um, certification. Because they, they, we explain basically the, the whole process that the fish went through and, and also the fact that the, the, the producer has actually um, uh, been certified as, uh, as someone who is producing uh, you know, certified fish products. So, yeah. Thank you, Kelvin. And uh, thank you all for quite um, interesting discussions on various aspects of food safety. Uh, I would like to invite each and every one of you, we start with Sarah, just to give us some closing remarks based on the discussions we've had and maybe the way forward in relation to food safety. Okay, thank you, Salome. Uh, thank you everyone for listening to this interest, uh, interesting conversation. And I think my parting shot is uh, the fact that food safety is an important issue for developing countries uh, where most of these studies were conducted. And I think evidence is coming up and it's my hope that this will, will help inform decision making by policymakers and also those of us in research. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, and all the best with your PhD. Thanks. So now we move to uh, Crystal, your parting shots. Yes, um, I'd say from our study that was um, very community-based and about perceptions, um, that uh, one of the things that we think needs to be 
um, followed up on because we definitely didn't reach methodological saturation in this work because it was um, very generically about concerns about food safety. And so we, were, we definitely wanna follow up on how the media aspects are affecting people's decision-making and how that information is shared. And so um, one of the big things is that people are using their visuals and their observations to make these decisions. And we all know that that's not the most accurate way to decide whether something's actually clean or not. So the concerns about agricultural chemicals, the producing conditions and that human contamination isn't something that can be seen. And so, but people are drawing on it heavily. Thank you, Crystal. Kelvin, your parting shots. Uh, thank you, thank you, Salome. Um, for me, it's, it's really to say that uh, you know, aquatic food systems continue to play a very important role in terms of um, uh, you know, nourishing populations. Um, uh, at the same time, we recognize that uh, uh, you know, issues of um, uh, food safety, you know, uh, food safety issues are, uh, are extremely important and we, we really need to think about those, especially if we, if we consider foodborne illnesses and the burdens that they place uh, on, um, on uh, African economies. So we really need to think about this issue. Um, one way is to provide incentives to producers, yes, uh, to, to sort of encourage them to, uh, to, to practice uh, good, um, engage in good practices, but we have to recognize that uh, that they are going to produce different products. And so in designing the, the certification schemes, we have to be aware that consumers are going to value products, certified products uh, differently depending on, the, on different attributes. And therefore we have to, we have to perhaps think about um, uh, certification schemes uh, that, that are tailored to different types of, uh, of producers. And, and our experiment shows that uh, for now, that would be based on uh, the sizes of different, you know, certified products that are being produced, um, and so that's uh, that's something to follow up. Uh, otherwise, this uh, as a follow-up study, we are uh, we are looking at really asking the question of whether the premiums that we observe in the markets, whether those can actually be transferred back to the producers, is a way to um, incentivize them to adopt uh, good practices. So that question still remains, uh, you know, largely unanswered. So this is just the first step towards answering that question. Thank you. Thank you, Kelvin. Last but not least, Vivian. Thank you, Salome. Um, so I think based on our research, I think it really shows the importance of following people's decision making over some time and, and not taking the initial results as indicative of lasting behavioral changes. Um, and where we're going to take this work next, um, we'll be doing a collaborative study again with, with Sarah and with researchers at the University of Nairobi to look at whether we can get um, informal food processors to adopt better practices through a, a a certification scheme that actually brings in the, the Kenyan government through the Ministry of Health. So I think involving the public sector in some of these certification, not just making it a private voluntary um, option, but actually bringing the, the force of the regula regulator to bear will be really important um, in, in bringing the, the potential benefits, especially to informal producers and consumers who, who frequent those markets. Um, so we, we look forward to sharing those results, um, hopefully in the next couple of years. Thank you, Vivian. And thank you to Sarah. Thank you to Crystal. Thank you to Kelvin and Vivian for very interesting studies and quite an in, uh, invigorating discussion uh, that has brought to light aspects that we need to take into consideration when we are looking at issues of um, food safety. Consumer behavior is a critical thing and uh, it's important for consumers also to have the information about food safety issues. Community perceptions about food safety are also quite critical. So it's an integration of all these factors that come together towards um, helping us um, understand and uh, come up with interventions that are wholesome and that will be appropriate to the different contexts that we apply them in. So uh, we have had a look at uh, food safety um, in various East Africa, uh, in, in various African countries, Kenya, 
um, we went to Nigeria and Tanzania. So those have helped us put into context different aspects of food safety. And uh, I would like to bring this to a close now and thank each and every presenter for taking the time to present their uh, research findings with us. I'd like to wish you all the best in your research endeavors as you continue on. And to all the participants who are able to come in and join us, thank you very much. And I wish you all the best. Um, I'd like to invite you to the next session, which will be the social um, aspects. So feel free to join in those social aspects uh, after this. And also just to remind you that you can access all the documents on the ANH uh, site. So in case you missed out on anything, it's not lost. It's not all lost. You can always go back to the website and get those uh, information. So thank you everyone and uh, have a good evening or a good day and all the best and thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, you're all free to leave now.